I invite you to turn your Bibles uh, to the Galatians chapter 5, and we'll focus on verses 16 through 18 today. And Lord willing, we'll continue that for the next couple of Sundays. And one of the very important topics which is presented here, and we decided to, to elaborate on that, to, to take a look at the specific details that the Bible presents to us, what is the life of the believer? When we're talking about Christians, we are talking about someone who had been touched by the gospel, and the gospel of Jesus Christ produced a new life within that person. And that's a very important. This is the most important thing for in, in the whole Bible. Actually, in the whole life, you understand that uh, our relationship to God is the most important thing in life. And that relationship can be established only through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which in essence reveals to us that the Son of God came down to this earth and He took upon Himself our sins and died for us and made us free at that cross and now His righteousness is being applied to us, and because of that, we are saved. That's the only way to be saved. Salvation cannot be earned. Salvation cannot be bought. You cannot achieve salvation or get it in any other way, just through the faith in Jesus Christ. Just when we trust Christ that He had died for us, and He carried upon that cross our sins, and He had given eternal life to us at that moment when the Holy Spirit touched our hearts. That's, that's the essence of everything in the Bible. Because of the importance of that thing, the Holy Scriptures present to us this truth in many different ways in different books of the Bible. And the book of Galatians, the epistle to Galatians, probably one of the most clearest and at the same time very rich presentation of the gospel, which is much needed to us. We need to be reminded about the gospel. We have that ability to, to lose focus, to forget, to lose that clarity of understanding of many things, not just the gospel, many other important things. And because of that, Scripture over and over reminds us that this is something which is vitally important to us. And this is why it presents to us very deep and very precise picture of the gospel. And if you remember, we were going through this epistle for quite a while already, and we uh, focused on the first half of that book where Paul defends the gospel, and he clearly defends that there is only one way to be saved. And he illustrates that, and he proves that, and he explains that, and he gives practical examples how it works in many different ways. But when we come to the second part, when we come to chapter 5, we come to another uh, side of the same gospel. We come to the point which uh, is no less important for us. And that point helps us to understand who is really having that gospel, who really accepted the gospel, and who has that eternal life in ourselves. And the reason for that is that there are many different uh, ways or different forms of Christianity which do not have the real saving faith. Let me read one verse from chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul presents the gospel in a, in a very short and concise way, and he says, For in Christ Jesus, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Here he compares two different realities. On the one hand, he says that uh, circumcision, which means the law, the rules, different kind of traditions, different kind of expressions of faith. 
And he, he was dealing at that time in particular with the law of Moses, with the mosaic necessity of accepting everything which comes with the Old Testament. And, and he says that in Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter how much you fulfilled the law or you were, were not able to fulfill it at all. It doesn't count. It counts as anything. And then on the other side of that scale, he puts something different. But faith, but only faith, working through love. And it's very important that he puts uh, these two modifiers here. He speaks about faith, and then he counts it, it's necessary to say that this is a working faith. It's not just ideological faith. It's not just philosophical faith. It's not just traditional faith. It's not just cultural faith, so we just count ourselves as, as Christians. We just belong to a Christian church. No, no, no. He says that this faith is actually working. It does something within us, and the main thing which it does, it makes us able to love. And that short statement is explained in details in following verses. Look with me to verse 13, and we studied that those verses in previous uh, uh, sermons. Verse 13, he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's another, the, the same idea, just another expression of the same idea. And the important word here is opportunity. This word had been used to describe military base. You know, when army that is, being, uh, is advancing and they are setting up goals to, uh, to conquer certain regions, so they have far enough distant bases, and those bases are used as a platform, as a point from which they actually advance. They are attacking their enemies. So what he is saying here, he is saying that it is true. When we came to Christ, Christ liberated us. He gave us freedom from the law. And this is what Christ does. But there is a problem that many people, many Christians, they are using that freedom as a point from which they allow their flesh to attack them, actually. And because of them, because of that, he warns us and he explains what it is and how it, it works, how it's being expressed in our lives. And he's, he's saying, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So if faith leads to gratification of the flesh, the flesh, it is fake. There is different direction, different motivating power which is in, at work in the heart of the believer. Understanding that, Apostle continues to, to present that picture even in more details, and he gives some some very important observations, and actually not just observations, but commands in following verses. And these verses will be subject of our attention uh, this morning. Verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. People saved by Christ, they have a complex nature. On the one side, from the moment of new birth, the Holy Spirit indwells their hearts, and He brings everything which He has into our hearts. But at the same time, we continue to have in our inner being our unchanged old nature. 
And these two spiritual realities are in constant struggle. They constantly oppose each, each other. And the apostle explains how this spirit is able to overcome flesh and how it's practically possible to win these spiritual battles. He presents two main realities here, and I would like to touch really short, really briefly on both of them just to go to whet our appetite, that we would be able to focus on those verses and on this truth and, and allow them to work in our heart that the Holy Spirit will bring forth His fruit in us. The number one thing, he explains the nature of the struggle of the flesh and the spirit. You have here point number one, the struggle. If you would add in, in your notes the nature of the struggle of the flesh between the flesh and spirit. So he explains that, and then he actually demonstrates how we can win. How we can win spiritual war within our hearts. So let's read once again these verses. But I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he presents a very interesting reality. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So he's referring to a normal single individual. It's not uh, some, sort of, uh, some sort of psychotic disorder when in one person you have two opposing sources of desires. No, no, this is a normal person. Even more, this is a normal believer who is in Christ Jesus. But there are some things which happen within us, and he presents to us, he calls as the, the fight between the flesh and the spirit. And in order to understand that, let's first answer, answer the question, what is flesh? There are many different ways how Scripture uses this uh, word flesh, but the, one of the main points, uh, main meaning of this word is a sinful nature, which we inherit from Adam and Eve. Let me go back to the book of Genesis and explain how it happened. In the beginning, when God had created human being in his image, he did a very interesting thing. He actually created a person who is capable of the same things which God has. A person who is capable of thinking, evaluating, making decisions, acting, and even more. Human beings are created with the ability to create. And all of that reflects the image of God in us. And that was done in such a way that humans had been created to be God's helpers. God is the owner of the universe. He is a designer. He is a creator of everything. He designed all the laws. He designed all things in the universe. And when he created us, this universe belongs to him, not to us. And this universe is set by him. He sets the rules and he sets the ever, all, all the physical laws. And all uh, sane people, they understand that you, you cannot invent physical laws. You can just discover them because they were there before we came here. God had designed those physical laws. And in the same way, God had designed moral laws. So he created us that we could cooperate with him, that we could live in harmony with him, that we could continue on what he is doing. So we will be functioning or we should, should function, we're supposed to function as apprentices to him. He's the boss. He's the master. And we are learning and we have that privilege to be part of his greatest work in the universe. But what happened during the fall when Adam and Eve sinned? Something happened. Something changed really dramatically in us. And that change refocused our desires. We actually, we, I mean people, we hijacked everything that God had given to us. And instead of cooperating with God instead of serving with Him 
to that great purpose of His, we, decide, we decided, or it's, it's actually not a decision, it's something innate, something which is deep down in us. We live to prove ourselves. We live to advance ourselves. We live to elevate ourselves. We, we, we live to point our independence. And this is what Scripture calls original sin. That's quite advanced term, and you're probably thinking this is, this is too theological for me, but you actually see it every, every day. You can see it even in small children. Uh, that's amazing to me when I looked at, at small children who even don't speak yet. But they have something in them that they, they would insist on their own way. And you know where it came from? From Adam and Eve. They considered themselves such an important person that everyone around them should be kind of circling about around their interest. And two major things is self-affirmation, self-elevation, and self-pleasing. These are two qualities of original sin. And they are everywhere. And they are in every person. All people living on earth are actually slaves of these two things. There are many different passages that prove that. Let me give you a couple of them. Ephesians 2, book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, explain to us this reality. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, that's, that, spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's, that's number one quality of sinful human. We are not in harmony with God anymore. We have our own ways. And this is something that we consider is an important element in our life. This is the purpose of our life. This is our identity. This is our meaning. We want things our own ways. This is why he explains here that disobedience is the number one quality of the sinful, uh, sinful human being. And number two, look what he is ha having here. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So that's the reality of human beings without Christ. We are marked by a rebellion against God, a claim for self-worth in contrast to the worth of God, as well as by pursuit of one's passions. In the epistle to Titus, we read verse, uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient again, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. So that's the reality of sinful human being. And that's an important thing, and uh, Apostle John in first epistle, he presents that as a reality of the world, the world, the whole world around us. Chapter 2, verses 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. He actually splits the first one into two categories. Desires of the flesh means, means physical pleasures. Desires of the eyes means kind of aesthetic pleasures, intellectual pleasures that we have. So the two major elements of driving or driving force of the world, these desires and the just satisfaction of those desires considered to be as the um, most important element in life. And then number three, pride of life. That's disobedience. That's the rebellious spirit. That's some ways, and we have many different ways to elevate ourselves, to find self-worth. Not to find worth in God, but trying to find self-worth independent from God. This is how all humans function. But when, this, when a person comes to God, when a person comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ, a revolution happens within our person. 
And that revolution brings with itself something very different. And that difference actually changes our attitude toward God. And that revolution presented to, uh, to us by the, by the Holy Spirit, which creates that different reality uh, which we have in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we still have present in our lives that remaining residue of original sin, which pushes us back to those two desires, desire of self-worth and desires of self pleasure. James, Epistle of James, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, explains in the context, addressing the believers. He speaks about the believers and he says, let no one says, say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Look what he is, he, uh, he is writing here. Believers are no longer slaves to, to desire, to passions. But they can still be tempted by being carried away and deceived by their own desires. Those desires live within us. That's a very interesting and very important reality. There's a world around us which lives by totally different sets of values uh, compared to God's values. And there is a Satan. It's a real dark spirit which is uh, fighting against our souls. But what he is doing, what Satan is doing, and what the world is doing, they are trying to entice our flesh. They are working through our flesh, through, through that original sin. And through that, they are pushing us into the forms of disobedience to God. This is why we see this reality, Galatians 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. In order to clearly understand that struggle, we looked at what is flesh, which is an essence of original sin, which is still in us, and now let us consider another question. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? What happened with the, with the believer, with the person who comes to Christ that make, makes this uh, war possible? You remember Jesus Christ and his famous conversation with one of the Ju Judean religious leaders, Nicodemus. He was explaining to him a very important reality. John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he is very clear. In order to be saved, it is not enough to say a prayer. It is not enough to do sort, some sort of rituals. In order to be saved, one has to experience new birth. And that new birth is done by the Spirit unless one is born of water and the Spirit. So some people consider that and they are looking for some supernatural experiences probably. But this is very simple. The scripture explains to us what it is, how it happens in reality in the life of every believer. Epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 18, gives us some light in that. Of his own will, meaning God, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creation. So this is explanation how it works. So there is a word of God. Word of God, which uh, reveals to us the way of salvation. Who God is, who we are without Him, who Christ was, what Christ did to us, how we can obtain the righteousness that He brought from heaven to, to earth to us. So this is the Word of God. And by this Word of His own will, so God is doing actually, He is giving us birth, new birth. He brought us forth by the Word of truth. 
So that happens when a person comes, approaches the Word of God, or comes in touch with the Word of God, and the Word of God is working within him and produces a completely new nature. Exactly the same we read in, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, I mean, meaning trusting in him, you had been sealed by the, with the promised Holy Spirit. Th that's another description of the same process. So the Word of God gives us that saving power, and the Holy Spirit is using this Word, word to create a new, completely new nature within an individual. And that's an important element. And that new individual is quite different from what had been in his old self. And there are several important elements of that that we need to understand. We just described that every person, all people, by themselves, they desire their own. They live for self-affirmation. They live for self-elevation. They live for self-pleasure or to find self-gratification and many different things. But when we experience that new birth, this new person within us differs from it because this new person loves God. This new person wants to be in harmony with God. This new person is kind of going back to the pre-fall, to that position where to cooperate with God is the greatest pleasure. This is why this new person is very attentive to what God is teaching us. Because this is the greatest joy of a new person. It's not a heavy burden. It's something that we understand when we had been born again. We understand that this is the greatest tragedy of the human beings that we missed God's design. We missed His wisdom. We missed His loving heart. We missed His creative work. And instead of that, we are trying to build something opposing God. So that new person, he gets in tune with God. They're working on the same wavelength. They understand each other. And this is why we have that opposition between flesh and spirit. That's the reality of real faith. There are several passages that help us to understand that. First uh, John chapter 3, verse 9, brings a great explanation of what happened with, uh, within us after we were saved. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. So if, if a person, inner person, that new person, who came to Christ, who, who had been born again, if it's there, the sin will be unnatural for us. You know, I, I explained that many times and it helps me to, to give some images. Uh, if, you, if you try to rubber ball, you try to put it under the water, you can hold it there. But it has inner power which is pulling it up. This is a human soul born from God. Yet the, there are circumstances where when we sin, when we fall, we do some kind of mistakes. But we have that inner, inner pull within us which pulls us up to God. This is what it means to be born again. And this is why we have that struggle. And he continues on, for God's seed abides in him. Just, just try to imagine this ball as a God's seed. If God's seed, abi seed abides in us, so we, we sometimes sin and we trample uh, above that God's seed, but it always will go up. This is why a believer cannot live with sin. He cannot continue on with sin. He cannot keep on sinning. Why? Because he had been born of God. That's the reality of new birth. In the same epistle, chapter 2, verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, 
You may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him, born of him. That's just another explanation of the same idea. In addition, being born again gives a person a person's heart the ability not just to, to live in harmony with him in terms of being or seeking his righteousness, but seeking his love and being filled with his ability to love. First John Chapter 5, verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is, is the Christ had been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever he has, uh, has been born of him. So this is God's love. It's not the love of Adam and Eve, sinful descendants. You know, when we are talking about love, we, we quite often uh, we, we, we take love as like. You know what's the difference between like and love? When I like, it's something that gives me pleasure. I like borscht or something else, ice cream or whatever you like, good apple pie. I like. Why? Because when I eat apple pie, it gives me pleasure. In the same way, way we like people. Why? Because it's good to be around them. Because they are in their personality, in something what is in them. They are creating the environment which is pleasing to us. This is like. But love is something different. Love does not depend on them. It is being born in us, within our heart. Love is the expression of our care, of our Design something good to the person who we love. And this, is, this, is, this can come only from God. We bow ourselves, it's foreign for us. God so loved the world that he gave his own son, only begotten son. There was nothing in us that God would like. It's all in his heart. So when we obtain that new nature, we obtain that ability. This is why uh, John is writing, describing that in, a, in a clear terms. So let's go back to Galatians 5.17. For, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you're a Christian, you had experienced that for sure. You had experienced that many times when you, you understand that in your inner being you love God, in your inner being you want to be obedient to Him, but you find yourself doing something different. You find yourself yielding to your flesh more than you want to. And this is how Paul described his own experience of that in Romans 7 he describes for I delight in the law of God in my inner being but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death and later on in chapter 8, he describes his condition for we know that the whole creation has been growing together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit. You remember how James was talking about first fruit within us that God has? First fruit of the Spirit. We grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our body. So believers live in the state of constant struggle between the old flesh, pushing them to sin, and the new spirit, one born from God and striving for God. This is how it happened in the life of the believers. So this is number one, the nature of, of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And now let's take the, the main thing here. The main thing in this passage, the victory of the spirit over flesh. That's the purpose. That's the main purpose of this passage, not just to inform us how it happened, but to make sure that we really can overcome. 
we really can be victorious here. Verse 16, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So here the apostle emphasizes two specific circumstances, two, two facets of that process. And here he explains that the number one thing is walking by the Spirit. This is what will give us victory. And number two, being led by the Spirit. Let, let's look at each other. Uh, look, look at these uh, two things uh, in, in that order. The walk, walk by the Spirit, the number one, number first word here, what, what we see is the word walk. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. This word peripate explains not just walking around when we're just moving. It's not explaining the process of movement. It explains the movement from one point to another, which is being done gradually, step by step. So when he says, walk by the Spirit, he has in mind a process of constant movement of a Christian, of a person who came to Christ, who had been born again, and that process has its concrete and practical, practically defined goal. This, the Bible calls it sanctification. You know, there are two things. Justification happens once. When we came to Christ, when we accepted Him by faith as our Savior and Lord, when we accepted His righteousness, He declared us righteous. And we are. And God is looking at us through the lens of the righteousness of Christ, and he consider, uh, considers us as his son, the righteous and perfect son. But at the same time, there's another side of the salvation process, which is called sanctification. And, th and that sanctification means constant, ongoing process, which takes place in the life of the believer. 1 Thessalonians, we read the ver uh, chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. He explains this process in the following way. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he says that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So sanctification is a process of gradual transformation of our inner world. And that's an important reality, and we need to understand that. We need to know what the Scripture tells about it, that we would, would know how to use it. We would know what to, how it takes place in our life. There are three practical steps that I would like you to remember, and we will see that, and not just to remember but ask God that he will give us ability to practice it, to really have it in our lives. Number one, all things begin with submitting our thoughts, our mind to Christ. So when we, when we say that we have these two natures inside, inside of us, we have this sinful old self, we have that original sin being present in us, and we have newly regenerated a new person who loves God and who follows God and who, who wants to get to know God. So we, we are talking about that process of uh, these two realities are oppose, opposing each other. But there is a practical way how we can make sure that God's Spirit will, uh, will have victory over our flesh. And he practically stays, uh, he states, he says, but walk in the Spirit or by the Spirit. So there is a practical, practical way how to do that. The number one thing is submit your thoughts to Christ. Everything starts with how we think. Our thought process is a central point of our personality. There are some people who could uh, express their thoughts in a more precise, more beautiful, organized way. And there are other people uh, for whom it's very difficult to do. 
but all people, all homo sapiens, you know, homo sapiens mean the uh, human being who thinks, who has mind, who has reason, ability to reason. All people are, first of all, are thinking individuals. And that's an important thing, what we think. And our thought process could be ruled or controlled by the flesh or by the spirit. This is why in the book of Romans, Epistle to the Romans, after presenting the gospel in the first 11 chapters, Paul uh, shifts gear and, and he presents the practical way how the gospel is applied to our lives. Number one thing that he says, Romans 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, by be, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So our flesh regularly pushes us to the more natural way for her, which means to live in accordance with the whole world around us. But our spirit gives us totally different desire. Our spirits understand that, spirit understand that the true reality is in the mind of God. He has the right picture of the universe. He has right understanding of the reality, correct understanding of the reality. And this is why Paul was saying, if you had experienced the work of the gospel within your heart, then make sure that your inner being is transformed by the renewal of your mind, how it happened? It happened very simple. It happens when the Word of God dwells in us richly. That's the only way how we can get mind of God. That's the only way how we can have access to the truth of God. That's very simple, that's very interesting, but this is the point where the spiritual war is the most, most aggressive and most hot. This is where the battle happens. Do you know why we have so much problems now with the attention deficit? The problem, it, it's, not, it's not just technology, it's a spiritual problem. The reason for that is that your mind Try to think about mind as a computer processor. You know, the, the, the chip inside, uh, which, process, which is processing information. And there are different processors, different computers. They can simultaneously do several tasks. And this is how we often think that we can be multitasking. And this is not true. Uh, you can, if you have good motor skills, you can by one hand, with one hand doing something, uh, one and something else with a different hand. Yeah, it is possible. But you cannot at the same time think about more than one thing. Our inner process, processor, that, that mind, is solely dedicated to one thing. Try, not now. Home, when, we, when we, you come home. Try, and, and you will discover it. You will discover it easily. If you don't think about, or, or you, you try to think about something, and then you catch yourself that your, your thoughts are sliding to some, somewhere else, and you are already forgetting one first thing that you, you started to think. And this is why the whole advertisement structure, the whole technologies, those social networks, even news feeds, all built to captivate our attention. They, of course, make money of it. They're trying to sell us something. And they need to do everything possible to keep us tied to that screen. Because once in a while, they, they will give us some information that, that sells something. This is how technology works. But behind of all of that, there is a satanic plan. He does everything possible to make sure that your processor, your mind, is not filled by the Word of God. And now we can hear so many excuses. Many different people, they have different ideas. When, when they say, just recently, 
Just two days ago, I spoke with one young man, and, <clears throat> and I, I asked him, every time when I talk to someone in a deep conversation, I ask, bring your, your Bible, your own Bible, not just a Bible, your own Bible. And when I look at his Bible or her Bible, I can say if it's being read or not. And that Bible is pretty new. It was five years old, but, but it was very new. It looks like uh, he rarely touches pages. And I ask him why. And he says, you know what? It's very difficult. When I just read the Bible, I fell asleep. I cannot concentrate. And I ask him, can you concentrate on something else? Oh, yeah. And there are different interests in different people. But you know that this is spiritual war. You know, the, it's very simple. If you all are not feeding your mind with the Word of God, your spirit, your, that new person is not able, does not have power, does not have strength to overcome your flesh. And instead of that, you're feeding up your flesh more and more and more. Quite often what believers do, quite often that flood of information is not sinful in itself. Of course, rarely I can see the believers who are watching porn pornography or watching some kind of immoral R-rated films, movies, or, or do some kind of bad stuff. They understand it's bad, although some do. But most of our problems come with just emptiness, vanity. Something which is just filling up our mind and takes away our ability to read, think, memorize, meditate, apply, and talk to others about the Word of God. So this is a core problem. I believe that this is the very essence of the problems of all pro or many problems in lives of the believers. John 8, Jesus He's speaking to Jews, some Jews who followed him, and they even believed in him. And he's saying to them, verse 31, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So you can, you can see that verse in reverse. If you do not abide in my word, you are not truly my disciples. That's very clear. If, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is the only way to freedom. Old Testament speaks about the same. Joshua 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it, not just read. You need to get your processor busy with the word of God. We need to, to learn how to do that. We need to get into that habit because this is the only way how our inner being, our new person is being fed, getting that source of strength in our life. And as I, I just mentioned, and, and he, he said that so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Today, as I just mentioned, we have countless excuses, varieties of means how, how we are distracted and uh, anything from I'm tired, I won't rest or I can't spend my entire time reading the Bible or sometimes uh, people say, no, I am free in Christ, so it means that I am free from reading the Bible. Oh, they're just, just uh, religious people do. Or they are in church every time when church open. Or oh, that's, that's just those legalists. But when we say that our inner spiritual being depends on the Word of God, we will use any opportunity to feed our mind, to feed our inner world with the Scripture. So this is number one. Number two. Second step, when we are saying about uh, uh, sanctification, second step, submitting our feelings or emotions to Christ. That's an important part of our life. We are emotional 
individuals. God had created us with emotions. And this is why the Word of God, this is why the truth of God is not just staying, you know, on the level of our intellectual understanding. It should, it penetrates our inner being. And more we are in that Word, the more His attitudes are working in our hearts. Lord willing, we will spend a little bit more time next, uh, next sermon uh, talking about <clears throat> Galatians 5.22, but let's let just read it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Try to analyze all of those elements of the fruit of the Spirit. All of them are part of our attitude. It's not so much understanding. It's our attitude. And that's a very interesting thing. It's, it's emotions based or coming out of understanding. This is how the Spirit of God is working within us and creates new reality. Philippians 2, verses 4 and 5, give us different re- real or different side of the same reality. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of other. And in the ESV, we have here, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This word mind in the original is much more than mind. This is why it is translated in many different versions. It is translated as attitude. Have this attitude. And then he gives an example of Jesus who left his glory and came down to earth and he actually uh, humbled himself to the point where he is serving us at the cross of, of Calvary, giving us redemption from our sin. It is at this stage of sanctification we receive true joy, joy that comes from Christ, not from the circumstances. One that comes from the giver, not from his gifts. And this is one very important test. If you want to test your joy at any, any point of your life, just try to see, are you enjoying gifts more than a giver? Yeah, it is good to enjoy apple pie. Nothing bad with that. It's good to enjoy good weather. It's good to enjoy God's creation. But if doing that you forget about the giver, we're idolaters. And our whole life is being geared into the satisfying our fleshly desires, not our spirit. And Lord willing, we will focus, focus on that next time. But that's an important thing that Christ is uh, speaking about in many different places. Uh, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, he describes that as the Father has loved me, so, I, uh, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So there is a very specific way how to get that sense of, sense of inner real satisfaction in our hearts. And that specific way is related to us being filled with the Spirit. So we will already mention two steps. Number one is submitting our thoughts to Christ. Number two, submitting our feelings, emotions to Christ. And number three, submitting our desires to Christ. Our desires actually come as a result of first two. A result of our mindset, the way how we think, our values, and then how we feel, and that produces desires. Look what he is saying here. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. So we have that inner engine inside of us, source of moral, spiritual 
uh, spiritually active things that we produce. And these desires actually make difference in our life. The desires of the flesh are more natural to every person. It is a desire in some way or form to elevate itself, to seek pleasure, etc. But to the extent that we grow in the spirit, new desires take shape in our life. Desires that lead us not to a passing empty or false joy promised by the flesh, but to a joy that is fulfilling, one that comes when we are united with Jesus Christ. To the joy which is described in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor uh, stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the, uh, in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Then he is like a tree planted by the stream of water, streams of water that yields its fruit, uh, fruit in its season, and it leaves, its leaves uh, does not win, wither, in all that he does, he prospers. So when we submit ourselves to the promptings of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, God's word, his truth saturates our will. Uh, it becomes pleasant to us. Life of obedience to Christ becomes desirable and joyful. We do not do it just of obligation, but we do it because we desire it. It becomes natural for us. And as a result, our life is successful. This is why the scripture uh, specifically points and warns us that we would be very serious about the relationship to the Holy Spirit. I will give you a couple of examples. First, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 19. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks to all circumstances, in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will prompt you to desire what God is desiring, but we can quench the Spirit. And then Ephesians 4, 29, we read, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give, you, give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So that's, that's the reality of walking by the Spirit, in the Spirit. That's number one thing that we need to understand. But he gives the second commandment here, be led by the Spirit. So in order to be victorious, to have victorious life in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, to have uh, that prosperous way of uh, sanctification, we need to learn how to walk by the Spirit, but also what it means to be led by the Spirit. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So walking by the Spirit is a simply a higher level of spiritual life. So when, when we are saying that we are walking by the Spirit, it's, it's something that gives us a freedom from condemnation of the law. We discussed quite a bit how Jesus Christ living on this earth perfect, in perfectly righteous life, he fulfilled the law for us. That is absolutely true. In Christ Jesus, we became righteous and the Heavenly Father sees us through the lens of his son's righteousness. But in practical life, we can be either joyful, successful, and fruitful, or it can lead us to endless defeats and despair and feeling down. And this depends on whether we are led by the Spirit or led by the flesh. A few verses later, Apostle gives us a clear warning, Galatians 6, verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. People often think when they gratify the flesh, they think that they are using or how people quite often say, I practice my freedom in Christ. This is not true. If your freedom leads to gratifying your flesh, 
you are not using freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ is freedom of the spirit that finds pleasure in Christ Jesus. And this is something that we need to understand deep down in our heart. That's a freedom to please Christ. That's a freedom to live in harmony with Him. That's a freedom to live by His will, for His purposes, to have His thinking and His feelings. This is what it means to have true, means to have true, true freedom. This is what it means to have that uh, Spirit-led life. The Apostle Peter once warned about this supposed freedom. Second Peter 2, we read verse 18. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise the freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. This is why the words of the, of the Apostle Paul are so much important. But I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not under the law. We'll pray now, and as you know, usually we pray kneeling down, and I will give you a couple of minutes just to think about your spiritual battle. There is one in your heart. There is one which is dealing with your issues, your difficulties. And I want you to pray now or, or to think about that in light of several spiritual realities, just to conclude what we say. Number one, if you are a believer, the Holy Spirit lives in you. That's one thing, one reality that we need to be thankful to God. If you know the Lord, the in, uh, that uh, supernatural, God's given Holy Spirit lives in you. Then second reality, your flesh always desires what is contrary to the Spirit. Number three, sanctification begins with the submission of one's thinking to the Word of God. Number four, this happens through reading, listening, meditating, and sharing or speaking the word of God to one another. Number five, to the extent of our thinking is obedient to the word, we gain the ability to submit our feelings to Christ. Our life is then filled with Christ's peace and joy. Number six, thoughts and feelings transform, transformed by Christ will produce in our heart God's desires and action. And this is what the victory of the Spirit means in our life. Let us kneel down and spend a couple of minutes in silent prayer, and I, then I will conclude. Our Lord God, we come to you with gratefulness. Gratefulness for your, your love. Great, gratefulness for your salvation that you had given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We understand that by ourselves we are opposing you. We want our own. And this is why we are destructive. This is why we thought you we are creating only things which are confusing even more and distracting even more and more. And we thank you for touching our souls with your spirit and with your word. That you had brought into our lives the salvation that was won at the Calvary, cross of Calvary for our sake. Thank you, Lord, that you united us with Christ. Thank you, Lord, by, that by your Holy Spirit you made us one with the Son of God 
who lived on this earth as a perfect man. Thank you, Lord, that today we are standing firm in that saving power of the work of your spirit and the gospel. And today when we looked at our lives and we see that struggle within us, we come to you, Lord, with the request, with the prayer. I pray to you, Lord, about my own heart and about every individual who is here before you. Lord, we kneel down before you because we understand that we depend on you. And we need your spirit working in our hearts. And I ask you, Lord, please help us to be faithful to you. Help us, Lord, to focus our attention to the things of the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to the Spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for feeding our souls. We know, Lord, that this is a source of spiritual strength and real spiritual life, and I ask you, Lord, help us to be in your word. You know, every one of us, and you know all the excuses and all real difficulties when it is difficult for us to find time to focus on you, to meditate on your word, to focus on fellowship with you. Lord, give us that freedom that we would be able to walk by the Spirit. That our emotions, our desires would be transformed by you that we would be filled with your love and your peace and your joy. Lord, we, we need it so much. And ask your blessing that we would have your desires, that our lives would become the source of your grace for the people around us. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.